Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, we have a, about 250 people registered, so I'm just going to give it a few more minutes before we get started. Um, but if you haven't already, um, just go ahead and you can start by just introducing yourself and your organization in the chat. All right. Thanks all for joining us. I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, a few more people well, as people trickle in, but if you haven't already, um, just go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat and your organization. We really want this to be an interactive webinar, so um, please do that. Um, so like I said, thanks all so much for joining us today for a conversation, Divest to Save Black Lives, Invest to Heal Communities, Advancing a New Vision of Justice. My name is Dewey Pham, and I'm a policy analyst here at CLASP. So this is the second part of a discussion that we started last week. Hopefully, many of you were able to join us last week, where we heard from leaders who are reimagining a new vision of justice. Today, we're going to hear from another incredible group of advocates and practitioners who are working on implementing parts of that vision. So just to get started, um, some a few logistics. Um, so please keep yourself on mute. Um, ask questions in the chat um, and then get to keep to stay engaged in the conversation. We're gonna have some time for Q&A at the end. So just please send in your questions as you have them. The discussion is being recorded and live streamed on our Facebook page. So we'll share the recording with you all following the event and please engage on social media with the hashtag invest to heal. Um, and like I said, so if you haven't already just continue by um, keep chatting your names and organizations where you're, who you're representing in the chat. I'm just going to start and spend a few minutes talking about the background and context for this conversation and discuss some of CLASP's work in this space. I'll then turn it over to our speakers who will talk about the work they are doing to invest in healing communities that have been harmed by the criminal justice system. The murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, Tony McDade, Richard Brooks, and countless others have once again elevated the daily violence Black people face to the national forefront. At the same time millions are protesting the state sanctioned violence, black people are disproportionately infected and killed by the COVID-19 virus due to a confluence of structural factors, including the absence of health infrastructure, a lack of culturally responsive healthcare and centuries of exposure to environmental toxins and stress. These dual pandemics have forced us to confront the fact that both the disproportionate impact of the public health pandemic and state sanctioned violence on black Americans are residual effects of over 400 years of oppression and the culmination of racist law and order policies and systemic divestment of low-income communities and communities of color. For far too long, we have underinvested in the health and well-being of Black communities while we've overinvested in systems that enact violence on Black lives. For example, the federal investment in workforce training has decreased from $24 billion in the late 1970s 
to about 5 billion today. In a similar time period, spending on corrections has gone from about 17 billion to 79 billion, while spending on police has nearly tripled from 42 billion to 115 billion. And as all of you know, our criminal justice system targets black and brown communities. This manifests in its law and order policies like the war on drugs that have led to black and brown people being more likely to be arrested and punished more severely than their white counterparts. We see here how it targets young black men and boys. Young black men between the ages of 18 and 24 are significantly overrepresented in the criminal justice system. While they make up about 12% of the total male population ages 18 to 24, they make up 49% of the incarcerated population ages 18 to 24. We can also see how public systems have failed these young men. 72% of young black men who are incarcerated do not have a high school diploma and 45% were unemployed before they were arrested. This is a systemic problem and not due to individual choices. We know that contact with the justice system has devastating and perpetual impacts on health, education, and economic opportunity. Prior to the COVID pandemic, the unemployment rate of formerly incarcerated black men was about 35%, which is significantly higher than the nation's rate of about three to 4%, of course, prior to this pandemic. For formerly incarcerated black women, their unemployment rate was over 43%. Again, these barriers to employment are systemic and not the result of individual actions or behaviors. It's the result of a discrimination, arbitrary licensing bans, questions about criminal records on job applications, and lack of supports in housing, education, healthcare, and more. These disparities have only worsened during the pandemic, which is why it is so critical that we explicitly focus on those impacted by the justice system in our policy solutions. And as we look to address the devastating impact of the COVID pandemic and state sanctioned violence, we must advance solutions that dismantle this system and build a new vision of community investment that doesn't rely on a system of oppression. Our framework for this new vision of community investment has emphasized large scale investments in jobs, education and healing as an anti-incarceration and investment strategy. Last summer, we brought together over 60 national, state, and local advocates, public systems leaders, policymakers, youth and young adults to develop a new vision of justice under this investment framework. What came from this convening were these core principles. First, we must undertake criminal justice reform with an anti-racist lens. We must also center those directly impacted and also advance economic justice for them. And lastly, we must move beyond small reforms to reimagine the system. During the convening, we developed a set of recommendations that would advance economic justice for those impacted by the justice system. First, to repair, rebuild, and invest in communities most harmed by mass incarceration and the war on drugs. This is about implementing reparations and building large-scale employment and education pathways that target historically oppressed communities. We must also invest in healing and provide access to healing-centered, culturally responsive health and mental health care. For those already impacted, we need to build high quality education and workforce pathways from incarceration to reentry. Education and workforce opportunities need to connect people who are currently incarcerated to a career pathway that connects them to a job or continuing education when they return to their communities. And third, we need to eliminate the collateral consequences of having a criminal record that are more often permanent punishments. We're gonna hear a lot more about this from our speakers today. But one thing we do need is a national subsidized employment program or federal jobs guarantee that ensures those impacted by the criminal justice system have access to quality employment. I don't know if we have yet, but we'll put the full paper and the recommendations in the chat. So now I wanna just talk to spend a few moments talking about how this all fits into what we're calling healing-centered liberation policy. At CLASP, the last few months have challenged us to confront our own role in this movement. As an extension of our justice work, we are committed to advancing bold and radical policy change. Radical change requires us to develop solutions that dismantle the root of oppressive structures that have persisted and evolved for over 400 years. I wanna give a shout out to our fearless leader, Keisha Bird. This is really her vision and healing centered liberation policy thinks beyond what is and demands what should be. It requires new decision-making structures, acknowledges failed and abandoned policies and recognizes both historical harms and ongoing discrimination. It advances a radical imaginative approach to reparations that isn't static and transactional considering a host of systemic policies that have economically persecuted and disenfranchised black Americans. Healing centered liberation policy requires us to follow the lead of activists and communities 
who've been doing the work of organizing and building community-led infrastructure to dismantle the police state and create thriving black and brown communities. This event is part of a series of engagements under this healing-centered framework. We'll be back in a couple of weeks with a conversation on healing. And we're committed to advancing this new vision of justice and vision of community investment that overturns centuries of white supremacy. So where are we in this movement? We've seen many proposals aimed at reforming the police, including implementing racial bias trainings and banning chokeholds and no-knock warrants that were responsible for the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. While these are important efforts, we know that it is not enough to stop the killing of Black people by law enforcement. We've also heard from organizations like Black Lives Matter and the Movement for Black Lives to defund the police and replace law enforcement with healing-centered alternatives and community investment. We see the divest invest conversation as supportive of the defund and abolish movement. This is only the beginning. We know that simply diverting some resources from law enforcement into communities is not enough to overcome centuries of oppression. We must ultimately reimagine justice. So our speakers today will talk about how they are advancing a new vision of justice. We're joined by Victoria Palacio from Legal Action Center, Quinton Williams from Heartland Alliance, Robert Sines from the City of LA, and Cassandra Webb with Cities United. Before we hear our first speaker, um, I just wanted to ask everybody to type in the chat what justice means to you. Give me one second to pull up the next presentation. Okay, so for our first speaker is my good friend, Victoria Palacio, who, um, former class where we used to share an office together. So we've come a really long way and I'm really excited that she's able to join us. Hi everyone, my name is Victoria Palacio and I'm the state advocacy coordinator with the Legal Action Center's No Health Equals No Justice campaign. I'm thankful to my, my dear friend Dewey and Keisha and their team at CLASP for bringing us together for this critical conversation. Furthermore, I am honored to have the opportunity to present on my organization's work, strategy, and vision as it relates to saving Black lives and healing and investing to heal communities. I would like to start by providing a little background on the Legal Action Center. The Legal Action Center uses legal and policy strategies to fight discrimination, build health equity, and restore opportunities for people with criminal records, substance use disorders, and HIV or AIDS. LAC has been around for close to 50 years with our main office located in New York, a smaller office in DC, which is where I'm located. And we have a, pr a presence in Georgia as well. Next slide, please. Our No Health Equals No Justice campaign is about two years old now. It was created in response to mass incarceration, which has been caused by the broken health system, the criminal legal system, and systemic racism that runs through the two. No Health Equals No Justice campaign is a natural outgrowth of the work LAC has been doing for nearly five decades to dismantle systemic barriers that are rooted in racist and punitive policies that perpetuate disparities in health, justice, and opportunities. Like class healing-centered liberation policy, our campaign recognizes that poor health, the general the generational impact of mass incarceration, unemployment, and undereducation plague our country. And too often, individuals in specific communities are blamed for being victims of this instead of addressing these community needs with resources and support. We gift these communities with over policing and mass incarceration. However, in contrast, our campaign, which is a multi state initiative envisions a system in which people are not incarcerated for their health conditions, and that at every possible point in which a person interacts with the criminal legal system, there are equitable opportunities for diversion. Next slide. Our campaign is built on these principles. Uniting health, 
criminal justice, and racial justice advocates, listening to the concerns of directly affected individuals, amplifying local and state advocacy by communicating ideas with national and federal policymakers and stakeholders, educating the public by promoting a vision for change that shifts the focus from incarceration and punitive measures to access to treatment and rehabilitation. Additionally, we strategize with our partners on how they can pursue policy reforms that emphasize treatment over punishment and improve public safety. And lastly, we ensure that we invest in our partners through subgrants and other forms of support. Next slide. So in the spirit of amplifying our partners, I have to highlight them before I go any further. Our current partners are Voices for a Second Chance, which is located in DC, Black Women Rising in Ohio, Just City Memphis slash Decarcerate Memphis, Lifelines to Success, which is in Tennessee, the Alabama Justice Initiative, the Ordinary People Society, Baltimore Harm Reduction Coalition, New York Reentry Link, and Women on the Rise. The majority of our partners are Brett our black led organizations and they, and they are at the heart of our work and they're an integral part to our campaign. And all of our organizations work to heal black communities. Next slide. Okay, so now that you know about Legal Action Center and our campaign, I would like to briefly reflect on the history that influences our campaign. This is the same history that highlights the need for healing. And although I won't go through this list, I want to highlight that this country has always dehumanized people of color, starting with the stealing of Native Americans land and attempted genocide of their people, along with the enslavement of people who were stolen from the continent of Africa. This country continues to hold people captive, not just physically, but economically as well and socially. Moreover, these systems of oppression have continued to transform and mutate to where we are now in this current moment with drug laws and the war on crime being a direct descendant of slavery. Next slide. Okay, so this slide right here highlights how the nation responded to previous national drug crises, crises with incarceration, which as we know is a different approach from how our country decided to address the current opioid epidemic. However, even now, as the media is in a frenzy because protesters are demanding for police to defund to defund the police, there isn't any discussion about Operation Relentless Pursuit or Operation Legion, which are new initiatives that have come out of Attorney General Barr's office. Both initiatives target black and brown communities and are flooding cities with millions of additional dollars to bolster law enforcement, intensifying law enforcement, sorry, intensifying federal law enforcement resources and in and increasing the number of federal agents in those cities. These initiatives come at a time when communities are already outraged about being over-policed and are demanding for current police resources to be reallocated to address community concerns, such as homelessness, support for those who are living with a mental health condition or substance use challenge, access to quality jobs and other essential services. Next slide. Okay, so here's a snapshot of some of the injustices that plague our criminal legal system. From this slide, I would like to highlight that 60 to 80% of people in the criminal legal system suffer from a substance use disorder. And that more people with substance use disorders are in the criminal legal system than are in treatment. It's not portrayed on this slide here, but approximately 50% of incarcerated individuals in state prisons and 45 percent of individuals in federal prisons have at least one mental health condition. Additionally, African Americans are incarcerated for drug related crimes at nearly six times the rate of white individuals, although they have a comparable rate of drug use. All of this highlights that our country would rather incarcerate a person who has a mental health or substance use condition rather than treat them. And of course, this is particularly true as it pertains to communities of color and those with limited resources. Next slide. Criminalization of substance use and mental health disorders has led to overcrowded jails and prisons, weakened communities, and perpetuated cycles of persistent economic and social instability. Next slide. 
Okay, so what the hell? I'm sure that's what we're all asking. Well, African Americans have a higher rate of being uninsured than white and Asian Americans. Additionally, African Americans have an increased likelihood of falling in the coverage gap in states that have not expanded Medicaid. These coverage gaps hurt us when it comes to every aspect of our health. It translates into reduced access to mental health and substance use treatment. We also see the effects of this gap in the form of high, sorry, high infection and death rates from COVID-19, like Dewey mentioned in his opening. Also, it has been proven that health disparities and mass incarceration are deeply linked, yet the healthcare and the corrections system are siloed. These systems need to better communicate with each other in order to increase access to care for people who are being released. There are situations, additionally, there are situations where people don't get the help that they need for their physical, mental, or substance use disorder until they're incarcerated. That is systemic and institutional racism. Corrections can't serve as our healthcare provider. Next slide. Okay, so if we were to divest from law enforcement, what would that look like? It would look like our campaign's main goal, which is to increase access to healthcare and encourage divestment and encourage diversion from punishment to treatment. It looks like quality healthcare, preventative care, treatment for conditions that coincide with justice involvement and harm reduction. I know harm reduction is a term that many of you all are familiar with, some may be less familiar with, but harm reduction is all about reducing the harms that people face due to using drugs, whether those harms are the harms that the drugs cause to the individual or the harms that systems inflict on people because of their drug use. And with our campaign, we take harm reduction a step further and we advocate for black harm reduction, which does the same thing to protect black people who use drugs, but also black harm reduction. It's just about protecting black people from all the systems that harm us simply for being black. And just the same, just the same shameless plug, we are having a three-day virtual summit on this topic on October 22nd through 24th. I believe my colleague is gonna put information about that in the chat. Okay, next slide. Okay, communities need healing, not over policing. To us, healing looks like reparations for communities and families impacted by the war on drugs. It looks like crafting policy and funding with the recognition that public health is public safety. And it looks like the elimination of federal, state, and local criminal record barriers to housing, education, employment, public benefits, and voting. And I'll say that again, and voting. Next slide. Okay. Although we abhor the fact that far too often healthcare and correction settings take the place of the community healthcare that people deserve, we strongly advocate for coordinating services between the criminal justice and healthcare systems. Next slide. I will end with outlining the investments that should be made on the federal level that we believe are needed to heal communities. We, along with our partners, advocate for the expansion of Medicaid. We know that Medicaid is not the end all be all when it comes to healthcare. And in some states, expanding Medicaid doesn't seem politically feasible at the moment. However, it is a great start. And where Medicaid is not expanded, we really need to support CBOs who are providing healthcare to communities. We advocate for increased access to treatment for individuals with substance use disorders and mental health conditions through insurance reforms, including the ACA. We believe to heal communities communities we need to abolish systems that use incarceration as a healthcare provider. If a system is using incarceration as a healthcare provider, that system cannot be reformed. It has to be demolished. And we need to ensure that people have access to medication assisted treatment and evidence-based care in situations where they are in the criminal justice system. Next slide. Thank you for allowing me to share about our organization feel free to check out our website at lac.org. Of course, we're on social media and you can learn more about our campaign online as well. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Um, and if you guys have any questions, please do um, share them in the chat and we will get to them at the end. So if any questions for Victoria or others, um, 
just come in. And I will let me pull up the next presenter. Our next presenter is um, Quentin Williams, with, who is the campaign manager for the campaign for, um, for Fully Free, the campaign to end permanent punishments. Um, at Heartland Alliance. So let me pull that up really quick. Great, Quentin. All right, uh, can you hear me do it? Yep. All right, perfect. So um, thank you, um, Dewey. Thank you, uh, Keisha. And also thanks to Victoria for that wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, thank you all for inviting me to be a part of this important conversation um, to talk about permanent punishments and how we can invest in directly impacted individuals to dismantle them. Um, as Dewey mentioned, I am the campaign manager for Fully Free, the campaign to end permanent punishments. I am also a doctoral candidate um, in the Department of Sociology at Loyola University, Chicago. And I am also an individual who has spent the great majority of his teens and 20s under some kind of correctional control. That means in jail, in prison, probation, parole, electronic monitoring. So I've had a wide range of experience in the way that these permanent punishments work. So I would like to um, bring this to you in two different ways. I wanna uh, show the, the issue of uh, permanent punishments, but then also show the type of investment that it takes indirectly impacted people to actually dismantle them. Next slide, please. So what are permanent punishments? Earlier, Dewey uh, mentioned collateral consequences. And we made a, 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 and that's what most people know permanent punishments as. Um, these are these legal penalties that create long lasting and often permanent barriers in employment, housing, education, civic engagement, and more for people arrested or convicted of crimes. And just a quick note on that, we made the, Oh, Quentin, I think you might be a little frozen. Oh, let me message him. Quentin. Okay, I'll just give him a second to get back on here. If anybody has any questions from the um, first couple of presentations, you can type them in the chat and we can answer them now for Victoria or for me or, or anything like that. Yeah, well, do we, maybe we um, will go to the next presentation and then get Quentin when he comes back in. Sounds good. Um, all right, Robert, are you ready? And there's no slides here. Cool, up a little earlier then. All right, you all ready? Yes. <laughs> all right, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Robert Sines uh, with the City of Los Angeles. Um, I'm in, uh, the assistant general manager over economic and workforce development, and I've spent my last uh, 30 years in the public se sector uh, working on these issues. Um, and I'd like to thank my dear friend, uh, Keisha and Dewey, uh, for inviting me to be a part and share a little bit of the work we've done here in Los Angeles. So I, first of all, I just want to applaud all the activists and the community uh, uh, change agents that are out there that are making a difference. Um, the public sector by itself, um, regardless of agency, police, uh, workforce development, social services, is not going to change by itself. Uh, we need and, and we have to have your advocacy to push us in the right direction. Um, so I, I truly believe 
the changes and the investments that are starting to come into uh, uh, resources and programs are really due to your community activism. So I just want to honor and uh, applaud that uh, up front. Uh, what I'd like to talk to uh, today is really about the uh, the use of transitional employment and subsidized employment uh, for to change some of the the outcomes of young people as well as folks that have had uh, a history of incarceration or history of homelessness. Um, the use of subsidized employment is a huge tool that really needs to be uh, utilized throughout this country. And uh, I do, we did talk a little bit about that as one of the recommendations. I wholeheartedly believe. Uh, just a little bit of, of history. Um, when I started my uh, career in the public sector, I started with LA County Probation Department. And in LA County, our African American population is about eight and a half to nine percent at the time. But in our probation camps and juvenile halls, uh, of course, we had close to 35 to 40 percent African American. So that disproportionality to uh, was just striking and stark. Um, and as I started in that system, I just knew that that was not the system that was going to allow uh, a change, and and we had to go upstream. Um, so I moved from uh, that corrections uh, type of uh, uh, organization to a proactive uh, uh, organization, and been in the workforce development now for the last you know twenty four, 25 years. Um, and, and really what that change meant was that we had to be able to provide opportunities, um, not just employment opportunities, but education opportunities. So when we looked from that disproportionality in the justice system and take it a couple steps back, uh, it really struck me about the disproportionate number of young people who were not uh, graduating from high school in Los Angeles. And those numbers, again, reflected uh, that same you know, structural racism that, that we all have been confronting, where the student population in LA public schools was again, eight to 9% African-American, uh, it was double to triple the rates of folks that were not completing. And when you looked at the Latino population and you're able to look at the social economic factors there, again, it was a huge disproportionality of folks who are not completing high school. So I always, you know, when I do these talks, I ask people, what does a 16 year old do who's not in school and not at work, does not have a huge social network and social capital? And oftentimes those are things that lead to criminality, lead to incarceration, lead to injustice. So I do believe that when we could invest early in young people and capture them. So this dialogue has been you know, decades in the making, but in Los Angeles, we do prioritize young people uh, in our workforce system. We prioritize young people that have uh, hit barriers and have dropped out of, of school and are not working. Uh, our whole system of what's called the youth source system is dedicated. We have 14 centers located in communities and communities of color that, that need our services. And we've been able to bring a slew of investments to these centers and, and able to get young people connected back to school and connect them to work. And uh, in this dialogue about disinvestment, uh, there was $150 million that through the uh, courageous political leadership of our councilman, uh, Curran Price and uh, Marquise, uh, uh, as well as uh, our mayor, $150 million, which to me is a down payment of that di disinvestment in the LAPD. And they did move it towards um, a workforce development, social services and other organi uh, organizations that will help address these issues. So the very first commitment that was made was $10 million to our higher LA youth program. And our higher LA youth program uh, over the last uh, decade, and which I'm very proud of, we've served over 30% of our resources have gone into South Los Angeles and African American predominant communities. So even being able to know that we wanna be purposeful, that we wanted to uh, be connected and we wanted to make sure it was impactful. So our investments are always rooted in those three principles. 
Um, that additional $10 million meant that we had an additional 3,000 young people that we were going to be able to provide services. And, and this is even without the COVID-19 uh, discussion of how much that has restricted um, uh, access to services. So we've pivoted and developed uh, virtual opportunities. Uh, one part of our program is very specific for the 1,800 young people who did not graduate uh, uh, this May, even though the school district gave everybody full credit uh, for the semester uh, while uh, 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 during this COVID-19, there was still 1,800 kids that were short units. So we specifically targeted them and said to them, we want you to come back to uh, get your high school diploma. We were going to assist you with the employment opportunity, and we used our higher LA resources to be able to do that. And we know in that 1800 population was virtually all uh, young people of color. It was virtually folks that were coming from uh, uh, some part of either the homeless, uh, highest proportion of homeless youth, uh, uh, foster youth, and probation youth. So we knew that we were impacting those. So that additional $10, uh, $10 million investment was on top of the, of the regular investment that we've had of $3 million. And we advocated at the county level to continue their investment. Uh, and originally the, our, our good bureaucracy said, well, we're, since uh, COVID-19 came, we don't have uh, employment uh, opportunities. So we're gonna redirect that money. We fought to keep that money invested in young people. And that was another additional 20 million countywide where the city is gonna see about eight or 9 million of that. So we plan and have a thousand plus kids right now working in various places um, and very purposeful that we're going to the communities that need it the most. So that's our initial piece on, tra on traditional and subsidized employment. And there's two other programs that I really want to highlight uh, uh, for everybody here. Uh, one is called Target Local Hire, which we, we've been uh, implementing for the last three years. And again, under the the political leadership of our councilmen and uh, our mayor that our public hiring in the city of Los Angeles, um, folks that came from communities with high barriers and the systemic racism, those folks do not come into our bureaucracies because they can't pass the civil service test or are not reachable civil service tests or you know for various reasons. So our target local hire became an alternative way to bring people into uh, good public sector jobs. And when you become a public sector employee, you have access to steady income. Uh, generally, uh, COVID-19 uh, is going to change a little bit of that. But uh, you have uh, the ability for health insurance that uh, Victoria you know, said it was really, really critical for not just you, but you and your family. And then you have ability to, uh, to have a, a pension and retire and be able to invest in yourself and have a career. We hired 900 individuals over the last three years through this program within our city ranks. So they're working in various departments uh, throughout the city. The mayor has made it a priority. Our council folks have made it a priority. And us as the, as, as the leaders in bureaucracies have made it a priority to hire those individuals. So part of the $150 million that was uh, moved, 10 million went to, um, uh, to our young people. There's going to be a percentage of that dollars that is gonna continue the program for target local hire. So as we were talking about reductions and furloughs and, and uh, hiring freezes, we're still going to be able to uh, hire uh, uh, folks from communities within the city infrastructure. Um, and again, another major uh, accomplishment, about 30% of, of, of the hires were from our South LA community. So that was, again, being very purposeful, being impactful, and being connected to a larger system. And the last uh, program that I would love to highlight here is called LA Rise. And we developed this about five years ago in partnership with our community-based agencies and our homeless serving agencies. And it was very specific to working with folks that were returning from the justice system or injustice system, we should say, and, uh, and or were homeless. And with those two populations, there's a huge crossover. Um, and as I mentioned about the city's population being about 80%, uh, 8% African-American, our homeless population is near 40% African-American. Again, another result of that historic uh, systemic racism. So we use subsidized appointments and there was no better way to actually uh, invest in these communities is by 
reaching in to folks that were ready for the employment. There's a lot of pre-employment services that are connected to it, but we are able to provide 300 hours of subsidized employment for folks that were formerly homeless or for, formerly uh, incarcerated to go into private sector work uh, and or public sector work. Uh, we are running about a thousand uh, uh, folks, uh, uh, I would say young people, but we start from age 21 uh, on up. Uh, we have a, a specialized program that we're working for 18 to 21 that we're wrapping around uh, the, the full services. But using this subsidized employment as a tool gets people back into the systems of, of the labor market. But more importantly, it, it provides a belief system for folks to believe in themselves that they can participate. They can re-engage back into our communities and reintegrate. Um, over the years, as we've built this program, uh, we receive investment from the city of Los Angeles, from the county of Los Angeles, and several other uh, community nonprofits, uh, REDF being one of our major uh, contributors uh, and, and on the program side. And it's a thousand folks a year, or approximately 35% African American, uh, who participate in that program. And each of these have evaluated outcomes to making sure that we're just not uh, doing a short-term uh, 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 employment, but this is really about transitional. If the subsidized employment is connecting them to good quality jobs in the long term. So thank you, Dewey, and it was my pleasure to uh, present to you uh, today some of the activities that we're doing here in Los Angeles. No, yeah, thank you so much, Robert, and because um, we were a little quick, but I didn't get to give you a full introduction, and so... No, that's fine. <laughs> Robert's been a really long time, great partner of ours for many, many years. Um, and as he said too, you know, this 150 million that was diverted from law enforcement into, um, com into communities and the mayor in a press conference literally said, we wanna invest in jobs, education and healing. Um, but we know, you know, the, the police budget is about 2 billion in LA. And so this is just a start. Um, and, you know, Robert's doing some amazing things with, with that $10 million. And, you, you know, we have a framework really here that he's established that for these investments, much more like imagine what we could do with, with 10 times that. So thanks so much, Robert. Um, and I think Quentin is back on. So, um, well, Quentin, are you there? Yep, here I am. Let's try this again. Try this again. Um, I got a backup too, just in case. No problem. Sounds good. It's all right. It happens all the time. So, <laughs> cool. All right. Hey, cool. I think I think where I left off, I was talking about the intentional language choice of uh, permanent punishments rather than collateral consequences, because this um, in our conversations with individuals with records, this was more um, accurate uh, descriptor of what their experiences were. Um, we were talking to people that had been 15 years, 20 years removed uh, from any justice system involvement, but were still facing barriers um, in these areas that I uh, just talked about. And additionally, um, the, the notion of collateral uh, makes it a, like kind of like an afterthought or an after effect. But uh, those of us who work in policy, we know that any policy that's on the book, state statute or administrative code was very intentional, purposeful, and um, somebody made that decision. Currently in Illinois, there are 1,189 of these kinds of sanctions that then act in 1,260 ways to impact people's access uh, to housing, employment, education, and other opportunities. Next slide, please. And in, in Illinois, the majority of these permanent punishment laws uh, prevent or hinder access to employment. 169 of these require or create background checks. The reason why the background checked um, uh, point is important because many times background check companies um, just get to run wild. They um, um, have inaccurate data. Um, sometimes they utilize records where they're not supposed to use them, such as arrest or juvenile or sealed or expunged records. So 982, we just had two amazing speakers, especially Robert uh, recently talk about um, employment and subsidized employment. So we all know, um, and it's been well documented um, by research that having a job um, really reduces the likelihood that somebody will continue to be entangled in the justice system. So these barriers or these punishments that continue long after someone 
um, uh, leaves a jail or prison or whatever the engagement was, um, we need to uh, get rid of those. Next slide, please. And then we have housing. So now it's only 40 here, but um, these 40 sanctions are devastating. Over the last uh, several years with our coalition, the Restoring Rights and Opportunities Coalition of Illinois, many of the folks within our coalition who are directly impacted came to us, came to the coalition saying that they could not find adequate, safe, affordable housing um, in large part because of their uh, criminal record. So we talk about recidivism, we talk about making investments in communities, but when individuals leave or when individuals acquire a record, individuals cannot even find um, a place to stay often. So that means they're either doubled up or they are actually homeless, um, roofless. So we had individuals in some of our programming within Heartland Alliance sleeping in cars and then showing up to um, employment um, with us because it was subsidized, like Robert said, because it was low barrier, like these individuals were able to do that um, in lieu of um, other employment opportunities that aren't readily available because of the laws that are on the books. Next slide, please. And then we have education. I think um, I, I, it's, it's, it's well known that individuals um, who find themselves in uh, both state and federal prison, um, education is one of those things that um, have not been, uh, one of those things that individuals with records uh, oftentimes don't have. A lot of them don't have high school uh, diplomas. And part of the reason for that is just restricting um, access to um, um, types of education. And here is where um, we get into job quality because some of these state laws and rec uh, regulations restrict occupational licensing. So individuals can go through programs and they can go and get a degree, but then when it comes to the licensing part, they can be denied uh, because of their record. I um, mean, that is what we're trying to work on here in Illinois. Next slide, please, Dewey. And then we cannot talk about any uh, anything related to reentry without talking about race because we all know the racial disparities that uh, make up the uh, the criminal injustice system. So black people in Illinois only make up 13% of the population, but make up 28% with arrests or convictions, 34% of people with convictions, and 45% of people with felony convictions. Think about that uh, that 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 enormous disparity there. Thirteen percent of the population, but almost half of the people with records in Illinois. So dismantling permanent punishments is creating opportunities for people with records, yes, but is also towards creating racial equity for Black people in Black communities that have been ravaged uh, by mass incarceration. Next slide, please. And again, uh, to the race um, aspect of this, 14% of Black adults um, were um, currently or formerly incarcerated as of 2010, compared to 3% of adults overall. Illinois has the third highest percentage of Black adults who are formerly incarcerated in the nation, third highest in the entire nation. So that's why this issue of permanent punishments is very critical to address here um, in Illinois towards uh, uh, racial equity. Next slide. So what do we do about this? We, we just simply believe that we have to abolish them. We have to abolish, uh oh, sorry, I lost my camera there. Uh, we have to abolish uh, the permanent punishments. And I like to say that um, we are trying to dismantle or abolish the prison after the prison. Because long after individuals leave the prison, um, there is another indefinite, oftentimes, prison that individuals face right in their communities, right in the places where they're trying to re-engage, where they're trying to come home, where they're trying to take care of families. People are in prison um, long after the so-called punishment or rehabilitation that uh, the correction system said that they are 
are, that, that they are doing. So how do we do that? How do we dismantle permanent punishment? So I wanted to give you half of just what the issue is. Many of you know this already, um, but how do we do this? And, and the framework that we are using uh, to try to dismantle them is really centering directly impacted people. So how are we gonna do it? The issue focus has to come from the community. That, that means it has to come from formerly incarcerated people. Um, so the fully free campaign, the campaign to end permanent punishments is central to a strategy, is centering the voices of uh, people that have been directly impacted by the justice system. And by voices, we don't simply mean just coming, telling their stories. We don't just simply mean them showing up to things just to be a seat at the table. No, we want individuals to share their stories. We want individuals to lend their expertise, but we also want to consider lived experience or lived expertise or being directly impacted as a legitimate form of knowledge, just the same way that a credential from a university is. Because individuals that have experienced the justice system directly have a lens and a perspective that others don't have, that we also need to be at the table with the researchers, with law enforcement, and with all of these people. But lived experience is a legitimate form of knowledge and knowledge creation. So we must, if we want to craft the policy solutions that are reflective of the folks who we're trying to impact, we must go to the community first before we even begin to think about what a solution might be. Secondly, not only getting them to tell their stories, but we need to train and make investments in leaders, um, particularly directly impacted leaders. And I mean investments, I mean material investments, resources, training, leadership development. We, within our coalition and within um, our strategy, what we're only we're doing, what we're doing is bringing people. They're lending their voice, but we're also making investments in individuals so that they can then be able to have the knowledge and the skills and be equipped to then actually transform how we do policy in the first place. Because for a long time, and even still to this day, individuals that have public policy degrees and so on, so, which is nothing wrong with that. However, the way that bills get passed and the way that legislation is moved has often been a few steps and a few miles uh, gap between people who know how that gets done and people who don't. And people, if we are going to say that we're representing the people and we are doing things for and on behalf of directly impacted people, we need to close that knowledge gap. If we want to see something different, we're going to have to empower and invest in people who are directly impacted about the political landscape, about the political context, about those backdoor conversations that we all have had if we do policy, about community organizing, about coalition and base building. That is all the knowledge that we hold in this field that we must transfer over to directly impact individuals. We also talk have to talk about decision-making power, decision-making power. Um, we can't just have people at the table, we have to give people really decision-making power. And I've seen this um, as an empowerment tool and as a way, we always say jobs, housing, of course, those things, absolutely, those are like the basic needs that people need to live. But what we also need is to empower people civically. Because once that happens, I've seen people take, um, you know, their careers and their lives to new heights. Um, so decision-making has to be also resting in the power of directly impacted individuals. For the Fully Free campaign, we have a, um, a governing board of all formerly incarcerated individuals and their vote about how we're going to move is just as strong and as important as an organization that is a part of the coalition. And then we go weekly, um, weekly to the Capitol. We're always putting pressure on legislators. We don't let up. And then also the lobbying is done by and not for those with the lived experience. And because of all of this, I think this strategy works. We've been able to do some great things here in Illinois. We've been able to uh, pass the most expansive uh, ceiling law um, um, in the country um, that did not make the false distinction between so-called violent and nonviolent um, um, folks. Um, we were able to make it so that they removed the lifetime bans to employment in schools, in park districts. We made it so that forcible felonies, people with forcible felonies could 
get their health care licenses reinstated. So that was the impetus for the fully free campaign. So now those 1,189 laws, instead of going after one, two, three, we're going after a real big chunk of them and effectively uh, dismantling them. So uh, uh, please uh, connect with me. I'm Q Williams at heartlandalliance.org. You can follow me on Twitter at Q Willie Leads. Um, and thank you all for giving me the opportunity to talk about this important work. Wow, yes, thank you so much, Quentin. That was really great. Um, so we have one more speaker, um, which is our also good friend, Cassandra Webb with Cities United. Um, we've been working partner with City United for many years now, and we're really excited to hear them talk about building Black wealth and um, ending violence in, communi in communities. All right, Cassandra. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Dewey, Whitney, Keisha, and the rest of the team at CLASS for inviting me to talk about Cities United's work in our Black Wealth Building Initiative, Russell, A Place of Promise. Again, my name is Cassandra Webb. I am the Senior Associate of Strategy and Innovation at Cities United. Um, and Cities United is a national network of mayors working towards creating a safe, healthy, and hopeful communities for young Black men, boys, and their families, while also reducing the homicides and shooting rates of Black men and boys, particularly between the ages of 14 to 24, by 50%. Our core values are around social justice, equity, youth voice, collaboration, and innovation. Um, Cities United was created in 2011 um, and, um, with two mayors, Mayor Landrew out of uh, New Orleans and Mayor Nutter out of Philly, as well as some national organizations. They really came together to look at the epidemic of violence across the country and decided that something needed to be done. So that's how Cities United was formed. And in 2005, our first and current executive director, Anthony Smith, came on board. To date, we have 130 cities signed on, and we work with about 30 of them really closely through consulting services, our Roadmap Academy, Young Leader Fellowship, and Innovative Projects. Next slide. Thank you. Cities United approaches violence prevention and reduction through a public health lens. We work with city government officials to develop comprehensive public safety plans that include the voices and leadership from community organizations, youth, and individuals most impacted by violence. We understand to see the results of reduced homicides and shootings that we must address state violence against black and brown people and communities, as well as the root causes of community violence through employing immediate strategies that stop violence, which includes violence interruption, street outreach, hospital-based violence intervention, diversion and alternative pathways, as well as collaborative public safety funding models. We also push the support of individual, family, and community healing and building on long-term solutions that, including, that include reimagining public safety through reshaping the criminal justice system, policy change, divesting from police to investing in communities, which means shifting city budget priorities to housing, education, mental and physical health, employment, youth, family supports, and other factors that build safe, healthy, and hopeful communities for our children and families. Next slide, please. Cities United has nine solution areas, um, as you all can see on the screen, to violence prevention and reduction. These include areas of community investment I've uh, mentioned and others have mentioned on the call, which are expanding healing-centered and trauma-informed practices, reshaping the criminal and juvenile justice system, and building an inclusive economy. And our work with cities, local and national organizations, youth, and philanthropies, we elevate strategies, programs, practices, budgets, and policy changes that align with these areas. Next slide, please. In 2018, Cities United launched two innovative projects that we believe are frameworks that address root causes of violence, invest in Black leaders and communities, and build a leadership pipeline for young Black men and city government, as well as develop sustainable wealth building efforts for Black neighborhoods. 
Russell Place of Promise, or as we call it, RPOP, is a project based in the Russell neighborhood of Louisville, Kentucky. I'll focus the rest of my presentation on that initiative. Um, but the second is the Civic Engagement Fellowship. It serves as a catalyst to changing the landscape for local civic engagement, participation and leadership by engaging young Black men aged 22 to 26 who are currently involved with or have previous encounters with the criminal justice system and who have committed to providing leadership to their city while serving as a vehicle to increase the life outcomes of young black men and boys, their families and their community by connecting fellows to opportunities, individuals and the support needed to be successful. The fellowship also focuses on identifying opportunities to make system level changes. The fellowship is a collaborative initiative between Cities United and two Kentucky city governments, Louisville and Lexington. Next slide, please. Russell, A Place of Promise is an economic justice-based initiative focused on generating investments in the people and places that make the Russell neighborhood and Louisville, Kentucky special. It is essential to us that we invest in the existing residents, organizations, and places that have long called Russell home and deter displacement. Next slide. So why Russell? Russell is a historically black neighborhood in Louisville, Kentucky. It sits west of downtown, close to the Ohio River, and is the gateway to the West End, a set of nine predominantly black neighborhoods home to 30,000 residents of Louisville. It was once known as the Harlem of the South, a culturally and economically vibrant neighborhood home to black restaurants, businesses, and a beautiful art scene. Prominent Louisville leaders lived, worked, went to school and did business in Russell, like May Street Kid, A.D. Porter, Lyman T. Johnson, Samuel Plato, Alberta Jones, and Muhammad Ali, as well as many other Black Louisvillians. Next, please. But due to racist institutions, policies, and practices like redlining and urban renewal, Russell, like many other historically black neighborhoods across this country, has experienced the harm done to black businesses, resident home ownership and renters, and other valuable assets important to the fabric of Russell. It has and continues to impact the ability for residents and other stakeholders to build generational wealth and thrive in safe, healthy, and hopeful communities. It is important for us to acknowledge historical and current policies and practices that lead to the impacts we see in our communities, as well as the ways wealth was created and how it's maintained in America. In and around Russell, there are hundreds of millions of dollars of current or planned investment coming to the neighborhood. As we've seen in Louisville and elsewhere across the country, like DC and Oakland, predominantly black and brown neighborhoods that experience high levels of investment in a short period of time leads to gentrification. Displaced residents and businesses, investment led by those that do not live or without ties to the people that have and continue to call those, their neighborhoods home. Next slide, please. In partnership with Cities United and building Russell Place of Promise is Louisville Metro government. They have committed to our pop vacant and abandoned properties, which include vacant warehouse property between 30th Street, Madison, and Muhammad Ali in the neighborhood. And this is across the street from the Louisville Urban Link's $52 million sports and learning complex um, that is uh, right across the street. Cities United's partnership is essential to this project as we serve as an accountability partner recommending policy and budget changes, as well as strategic planners and thought leaders, connectors to local and national partners, relationship builders with residents, faith leaders, businesses, and community-based organizations. In two to three years, our pop will roll out of incubation and become its own entity designed in partnership with residents and led by residents. Next slide. The current Black wealth building strategies we've identified are based on national and local data, in, things in, in conversations that we have heard with residents and guided by experts in Black wealth building. These strategies focus on home ownership, business retention and creation, 
workforce development and job placement, and community ownership of neighborhood assets, which includes the Madison Street warehouse property I referred to earlier. We are building out a model of investment that includes residents owning parts of the property and future building to, to grow equity and wealth. As we learn more about the impacts of COVID from Russell residents and business owners, we are also supporting efforts to stabilize existing renters, homeowners, places of faith, and businesses. Next slide, please. A part of Cities United's incubation role in RPOP is to support an outreach team working with these groups, residents, business owners, community-based organizations, and faith leaders. Their role is to build relationships, to elevate the voices and the stories of Russell, provide leadership development and opportunities for neighborhood and citywide decision-making, advocate for policy change, and inform our place strategies, which includes the Madison Street property, workforce development and job placement, home ownership, and business development. Next slide. Thank you. Our roles, we see ourselves with RPOP as being connectors, organizers, gap fillers, and accelerators. We as connectors are connecting residents, faith leaders, community-based organizations, and small businesses to the resources for stability and growth. As organizers, we are working with those groups to build on the individual and community wealth building goals. As gap fillers, we're working with the groups to identify what's needed and how we can fill on those gaps so we can reach the collective vision of Black wealth for Russell. As accelerators, we're working with groups to also learn, build, lead, and grow Black wealth in Russell. Next slide. Thank you. Over the next couple of years, RPOP will continue to evolve, grow, and be resident-led. At Cities United, we hope this promising initiative can be a model for other neighborhoods in Louisville and in our partner cities across the country. If you're interested in learning more about RPOP and the Civic Engagement Fellowship, please reach out to me by email or check out our social media pages. And I see that our executive director, Anthony Smith, is sending out those pages right now. Um, and next slide. If you're interested in learning more about Cities United in our work with young leaders, with mayors, um, community-based organizations, and faith leaders across the country, please um, reach out to our and visit our website. If you're interested in finding out more about our work, you're looking for resources, or we'd like to know if your city is a Cities United city or how to become one, um, visit our website, or you can also reach out to me and Anthony um, in the chat box as well. We also have a virtual convening coming up in a couple weeks, Reimagine Public Safety, Moving to Safe, Healthy, and Hopeful Communities. That's gonna be September 23rd through the 25th. So please visit our website and our social media pages to find out more information about that. Thank you, class. And I appreciate the rest of the speakers um, on this uh, call today. And back to you, Dewey. Thanks so much, Sandra. Um, and thanks so much to all of our panelists. I know it's you know four o'clock at the end of the week and everybody is really zoomed out and a lot of watching a lot of webinars every day. So I really do appreciate everything. I also just wanted to quickly thank my team that's been so, so supportive of all of this. So Keisha Bird, our director, um, Kayla has been amazing. Whitney, she's been in the chat if you've seen her. Uh, my other teammates, Noel, Isha, and Nia. Um, and of course, um, Nick Martinez with our communications who's been um, live streaming this on Facebook. So thanks all. Um, and now we have some time for questions. So um, if you haven't yet, or please send, if you have any questions, please send in some in the chat, or um, maybe even if you you know, feeling courageous, want to get off of mute, we can do that too. Okay. I was gonna, I was gonna say many people were doing a lot of connecting um, on the chat. And so we'll definitely follow up with all the presentations. There's all of our partners and friends you spoke today have a number of different materials um, that can support this work locally in your communities, your state. 
you know, as we started off this conversation, this is about dismantling and removing the harmful carceral systems, but also how do we invest in the in, in, in communities to support them thriving and us thriving. And so our partners have a number of different resources and we'll definitely um, share those with you following um, this session. Yep, great. Well, and um, for next steps for us, you know, like I said, this is a, a part of our series on healing centered liberation policy. Um, we're still um, in September 16th, we'll be hosting another conversation specifically on um, health and um, healing. Um, so I think Whitney just put the link in there, but so we're gonna continue having these conversations. We really wanna continue shaping the conversation around the investments and the really important need to divest and demilitarize law enforcement, protect black lives and invest to heal communities. Um, so thank you so much everybody for joining. Oh, I think there was one question, Dewey. Oh. Um, well, well, Tony asked if Victoria could review some of the policy proposals that she mentioned. I don't know if she wants to. Slides. <laughs> no, no slides. Um, Just ask her to review them. No slides. <laughs> okay, I have them in front of me, so I can. Um, I mentioned that our campaign's main goal is to increase access to health care and encourage diversion from punishment to treatment. And that looks like preventative care, treatment to, sorry, access to treatment for conditions that most often coincide with justice involvement, such as substance use disorders, mental health illness, HIV or AIDS, hep C, harm reduction, and diversion. And then I listed specific policy priorities on the federal level, which include expanding Medicaid, increased access, increased access to treatment, um, through insurance reforms and also reducing um, the impacts of incarceration in terms of collateral consequences and barriers to opportunity. Thanks. And I see another question too coming in. Um, so anybody uh, can, in terms of policy and ensuring that those who will be directly impacted are empowering slash have a voice, um, can anyone share how your organization is doing that. I know, Quentin, you just talked a lot about this. Um, so I don't know if you want to go or anyone else. Cassandra, I, I, you want to talk to the, fellow, the fellowship program is a good example as well. Yeah, I mean, quickly, um, I mean, we, um, and this has been evolving, what we um, have been doing, I'll talk specifically about the Fully Free campaign. I think because we were in a planning year and really planning our strategy, we brought directly impacted people in from the very beginning in terms of when we were crafting our plans and how do we connect with directly impacted people? Um, because there's so many, uh, there's a lot of people with records in the world, but also in Illinois, but also the organizations uh, that we work with also have um, connections and tentacles in the community to where uh, we go out and just ask people to attend uh, meetings. We ask people to come um, and we listen uh, to them. So listening is the first step. And I think after that, um, really working collaboratively with them to um, develop whatever policy solution we think will address the issue that people are lifting up for us. And then in the middle of that process, we are constantly um, you know, empowering people in a number of ways. Um, one that I want to make clear to folks is just make sure we're paying people for their time. We're not just asking people to come do stuff for free. We're also uh, giving them real decision making power. Um, we also uh, conduct surveys. We do focus groups. Um, we just we, we do a number of things to engage. Um, and if you ever uh, I don't know who put that question in there. If you want to talk more. Um, in depth about you know how the step-by-step -step process looks for this engagement, uh, please reach out to me and I'd be happy to uh, to speak with you. Yeah, and um, I can add on to um, to what Quentin was saying um, in regards to Cities United Civic Engagement Fellowship. The fellows that are participating in that program are actually employees within city government. Um, yes, they do have experience being in the criminal justice system, either 
previous experience are currently involved. Um, and they are actually become full-time employees um, of city government in Louisville and in Lexington. So part of that, they receive um, you know, healthcare benefits, um, any of the typical employee benefits, they receive those um, by being employed. They also, um, through their employment through city government, have opportunities to um, work with mayors um, as well as other city officials, uh, city council members, and really be able to advocate on behalf of themselves as well as their communities. And so we really see that um, at Cities United as not only an opportunity for leadership development, but really to be able to shift what city government looks like, um, because typically um, in city governments, um, you know, you do not see young black men holding positions. They are not employed um, at city government. And so for us, this is an opportunity to really get the voices of those that are most impacted um, by violence, by, by systems um, uh, um, like incarceration, really get their voices heard, um, and then, then be able to make decisions on a citywide level. Okay, well, um, I think without any more questions, I think we can wrap up a little early and um, thank you all so much again. Um, I, like I said, we'll have, we have recorded this conversation. It's been live on Facebook. So we'll, um, we'll have a new page. We'll send this, the recording out with our conversation also last week. And then um, please stay tuned for more and hopefully you, um, uh, Yes, who will be the next Robert? <laughs> That's a great, um, <laughs> a great piece there. Um, and so hopefully we'll see you all in a couple of weeks too with our next Healing Center Liberation Policy um, in engagement. So thanks everybody, talk soon. Bye everyone, thank you.